Hello and welcome. Still having a lot of rain here and I think in most parts of Sri Lanka it continues. But we're getting to the end of our official rains season or rains retreat, the Vasa. And uh, I won't be traveling on, I'll be staying here. But I don't expect the rain just to stop in accordance with those uh, conventions. The weather can be no more predictable than anything else. All subject to anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and out of our control. And it is this that forms the core subject matter for what I talk about here. Thank you for all your encouraging comments and the questions I've received, which I'll talk about now and hopefully help you in your practice. It also helps me in my practice to continually be reflecting on these basics of Buddhism, which are all so very important. That brings me to the first question. Uh, may I know what book you'd recommend Buddhist laymen, Buddhist laymen to read? especially the suttas. So, I mean, if you were coming to me asking this question, having never spoken or heard about Buddhism before, I would recommend you look at a book called The Word of the Buddha by Bhante Nyanatiloka, which you can just Google and it will come up with some, point you in the right direction for that book. And it's a good summary of the suttas. But it sounds like you're asking for something specific, a book to read, especially the suttas. Well, the suttas, read the suttas. Uh, if you were asking about Christianity, uh, you'd uh, be directed towards the Bible, uh, Islamic faiths, the Quran, Judaic faiths, the Torah, and in Buddhism, the Tipitaka, which is the three baskets, it means literally containing the Vinaya Pitaka, which is rules, really, for the rules of monks and nuns, uh, the Sutta Pitaka, which is all of the teachings of the Buddha, and is a collection of books, which is why it's called Three Baskets, because in each of these baskets is a further, are further divisions, collections of books, so it's not just one book. Like the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, is many books contained in one big book, as is the Tipita, Tipica. But traditionally, we keep the books separate because of the way they were blocked, contained in parchment form. Um, the Majima Nikaya is the starting point, which is the middle length discourses of the Buddha. The teachings, the word of the Buddha, they're described or summarized really in the uh, book I recommended by Bhante Nyanatiloka, The Word of the Buddha. And even more preceded or summarized or in shortened form, they are contained in the, in the chanting book. So if you look at the Theravada, Pali, and whatever your language is translation of, chanting book, you'll find the core teachings, the Dharma Chaka, the first teachings, a teaching of the Buddha, of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, and subsequent teachings, including Anapanasati, Methods of Meditation, and Reflections, all contained in those chanting books in a very summarized form. Not a literally accurate, necessarily, translation of the original Pali Canon, which is what I refer you to for your main study, if that's what you want to do, um, but a good enough summary to get the idea. And I'd further say, don't bury your head in books, just practice. If you've got an understanding of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, then you'll know the Noble Eightfold Path can be simplified by saying sila, moral virtue, samadhi, meditation, and panya, wisdom. Uh, this is the practice, and this is what we should be doing. Not studying, actually doing it. You cannot learn to swim from a book like you will not learn or find your way to enlightenment from a book. Many arahants, many enlightened beings have not found that way by reading. Uh, they may have heard some teachings or the word of the Buddha, but this was just the uh, final piece of the jigsaw that put all their practice together for them 
where they were able to become enlightened from just hearing a few words. So they'd had many, many uh, lifetimes or even within this lifetime, hours, days, weeks, months, years of practicing, keeping moral precepts, practicing meditation, developing wholesome mind states and reducing unwholesome mind states. And then the final piece of the jigsaw where it all clicked into the pace, place was just hearing the word of the Buddha. So it's not a practice that recommends a lot of book reading, although that is the choice of many and it's of a wholesome activity. But the Buddha did not recommend in any of his teachings that you sit down and learn this from a book. Rather, you sit under a tree, you close your eyes and you meditate. And this is the way forward. And uh, similar really in the way this question is uh, I mentioned in this video you mentioned that you use YouTube to listen to other Dharma talks do you have recommendations of one or more other Dharma talks to listen to on YouTube well specific Dharma talks I mean there are so many so I can't just give you recommend one or another but there are also many channels <coughs> um, I, I listen to a few, I subscribe to a few channels um, to which, you know, they're, they're, they're produced by sanghas, monks and, or nuns that I'm familiar with. But in terms of recommendation, this is like when you're finding a teacher. Um, it's personal to you. I can't recommend uh, who someone, uh, well, you wouldn't be allowed to as a Buddhist monk, but um, you wouldn't want to recommend to another person whom they'd uh, start dating and eventually marry. Uh, you, your idea would be might be completely different to them and it's very much a closely related partnership teacher to student and these Dharma talks online are teachers talking to people who are interesting, interested in what they have to say and we cannot be expected to like all of those teachers so what I might find appealing because you do need to have a certain affinity, a relationship, a synergy um, with someone that you're listening to in order for it to, the words they're saying, to resonate with you and for you to understand more easily. We all had our favorite teachers at school and from the, the, those were the ones from which we learned more easily. So I'd suggest you have to look around a little. As far as what I could very safely and happily recommend would be the Amavarati. Amavarati, I'm sorry I can't somehow magically should give you the links but if you go to YouTube and search even if you spell it incorrectly it should come up Amavarati Buddhist Monastery Chitta Viveka Buddhist Monastery and Abhayagiri Buddhist Monastery or if you simply go to forestsangha.org you'll find the list of monasteries there their respective websites and you should be able to find their YouTube channels that way but I just repeat it again um, Amarava, Amarava, Amaravati is one uh, should, just that one word should do Abhayagiri is another that one word should do and Chita Viveka that I was talking about the other day would also uh, just uh, bring up that channel um, other than that there are many 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 others including this but not all of them will appeal to all people's tastes and uh, the three I recommend there are because they are a good basic, uh, not basic, they can be very advanced in some of the teachings there and each of those channels contains many many Dharma talks from many different monks um, and nuns and on many different subjects so there's just so much I can't recommend anything specifically it's the Pali Canon is our main reference going back to the books so the Vinaya Pitaka, the Sutta Pitaka and the Abhidharma mainly the Sutta Pitaka, the words of the Buddha the 184,000 teachings he sat down before either monks, nuns or lay people or all um, and spoke, he taught, these were then uh, repeated uh, verbally at first and eventually written down uh, and formed this collection of teachings of suttas. This is where you should concentrate if you're going to be reading all of your study. 
and you'll learn quickly that you can skip through a lot of the repetitive nature of them. You don't need to read them literally. You don't really, if you can get a good enough translation in your language, have to get so excited about translating each Pali word so specifically correctly or worrying about the very many translations. Go to Sutta Central, something like that, or, or, or um, that's the only one I can think of, which is online, and that contains any, if you have specific suttas you've heard about that you wanted to read for yourself, or again, look on YouTube and you'll see that many of the suttas are read by monks, by nuns, by other people, um, and uh, you can listen to them that way. Um, so, I have spoken about this, I think, many times anyway, and perhaps even there are some written um, I've even put lists in places, I don't know. Um, is it a crime to swallow whilst meditating? Well, nothing's a crime, um, so not really sure why you say that. If you sit and you meditate, you might naturally swallow. <laughs> At first, this is perhaps because you are over-salivating. This is, means you have hindrances, something that's interrupting your meditation, in this case, um, wanting something. Uh, often you salivate because you're thinking of eating, thinking of drinking, thinking of food, in which case you're going to need to swallow, you, otherwise you dribble. But soon as your body has time to settle, it will naturally relax, as will your mind when it has time to settle, will naturally become calm. And these kind of hindrances will drift away in their, on their own accord. But nothing's a crime, nothing's right, nothing's wrong. The main thing is you sit relaxed and allow yourself time your body time and your thinking brain time to settle and then in turn they will become relaxed and respectively become calm. Uh, this, is, this is how we meditate. And the city is the most unnatural place imaginable. So that's more of a comment but it's, 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 it's not so uh, unnatural. I mean, not meaning to, I'm not sp trying to disagree there or anything, but um, beings, whether you're <clears throat> they're ants or humans, come together in one place and form what we call conurbations, groups, communities, societies. And in order to do that, they all have to have housing and buildings to cohabit and live together in. If you look at ants, they build enormous structures. Termites, especially in places like this, build huge cities they could be described as for little people, little termites. Um, uh, so it's very natural actually and they are even if they're concrete and steel these are all elements coming from the ground this is a concrete floor but it's made of sand it's made of lime it's made of I don't know what concrete's made of but some things that eventually can be boiled down to the basic elements of earth, solidity, water, uh, liquidity uh, the temperature at which it remains solid at, um, fire, if you like, heat, and wind and movement, flexibility, otherwise it would crack. This is all part of nature as is found in cities. As far as the practice is concerned and our meditation, well, I have to say, uh, whether you are in the forest, in a mountain scenery, scenic place, um, at the coast, in deep inland, by a river, by a waterfall, in a cave, under a tree, in an empty building, or in a city of skyscrapers and, and office buildings and such like, and busy roads, networks, and um, monorails and underground stations. It makes no difference, perhaps, whatsoever, once you've established a firm uh, idea of your practice because you will always have distractions. I'm in a very quiet place but this morning there's been some things going on in the building next door which is used as a kind of an out building cooking place because a lot of the cooking here is done on these ovens with you just put trees in and light them and and they don't have those in the house in in, in the nearby nearest uh, neighbor's house so it's quite near to here so there's talking there's banging of pots and pans um, but even in the forest itself, you have cicadas, monkeys, peacocks, squirrels, chipmunks, everything making a noise. There's never peace and quiet. 
But saying that, if you went into a sensory deprivation chamber of no sound, no sight, no seeing, no light, nothing, and you were immersed in sort of warm water so you could just float, um, they do have such things, I, I think, or would imagine. Um, you're still going to have the main hindrances, distractions, which are formed in your mind, sankara, in your mind, um, of sensual desire, aversion, laziness, restlessness and worry and doubt. It's all still there. So don't see city life as an obstacle to your practice. I've had actually some of the most, uh, my most notable meditative experiences in some very busy city environments, namely railway stations in India, which I've been stuck on for in not many hours, sometimes days, in the same place and had no alternative other than to meditate with all sorts of a hullabaloo going on around me. Um, a railway station with sort of 33 platforms and upwards of that and that size of a sort of an establishment with thousands no millions probably of people coming and going each and every day and I've been able to get into some very deep uh, absorbed states of samadhi more out of necessity to cope with the situation and in that sense taking viveka shelter refuge in uh, the fact that I could develop samadhi relatively easy at that stage and then enjoy the solitude that I find within rather than relying on the peace and quiet of external environments. We should not rely on anything externally for our meditation practice but of course when we begin this practice when we start out it is perhaps necessary. I will say I began and started this uh, out, uh, started my practice by going to monasteries and found there were other uh, uh, hindrances. It might not have been the busy city sounds and lights and distractions, but just the uh, to me at that time, the strangeness of the environment. I was a fish out of water. It was completely alien to me. Monks were completely alien to me. I'd never seen such a thing before. Um, and it was all in a way quite frightening and very, it made me feel very self-conscious. Uh, in a way, because of this, I just didn't dare move. I sat <laughs> and I, I somehow struggled uncomfortably into a lotus position and had a lot of pain, but just sat with it and thought, I just dare move. I don't think it's appropriate to move in this environment and just grin and bared it and developed huge amounts of patience this way, which is very important in our practice. Um, but that too is an extreme I wouldn't recommend. Relax about it all. Just enjoy the ability to just do nothing at first and then you will soon find yourself being able to meditate. And whether you're in the city or you're in the forest, it shouldn't make too much difference. In fact, you have much more comfort in the surroundings you are in in the city because you'll have, you won't have a wet floor. This is soaking wet, this floor, and it won't dry out probably for days. And damp, humid air. This is like a sauna in here at the moment. The fan, I have a fan which is keeping me relatively cool, but the robes are all damp and wet. The fan is dripping with black water from, that's coming out of the air. It may look pretty and nice, but you're only getting a little fraction of, of, what, of, of what actually is the experience. But none of that is, is going to bother me. It doesn't bother me. At night, I'd wrap this wet robe around me. I still sleep for the hours that I need to sleep. And then I wake up refreshed to meditate immediately because there's not much else to do, but that's what I enjoy doing. So I think that's going to come on into another question in a minute, actually. Hmm. How can we be sure that what has been written in the suttas is actually Buddha's true words and teachings, taking under consideration the fact that those had been written 400 years after his death same applies with Christianity. Yes, it wasn't quite 400 years in the case of the of Buddhism. I don't know the specific timings of it, and it varies depending on what source you hear it from. But you can't be sure. Um, of course you can't be sure. 
we can't be sure of anything unless we experience it and see it for ourselves. And that's what the Buddha tells us in those suttas that we can't be sure of. Now we can't be sure that it's his words, but it doesn't matter because he says, don't believe me, even if you're sitting in front of me. He said this to someone, apparently, which you can't be sure of, sitting in front of him. Don't take my word for it. Go away and practice, experience it for yourself. And then you'll know. So that's all that's said in those suttas. You can be, however, pretty sure that because they were repeated verbally time and time again, and what was being said was being practiced, and was working, that they lost very little in their content through transference, because what was being said was the truth. If you tell a story, a fairy story, a fable, a tale, it can vary over time, because it isn't the facts. But when you identify the truth, there is suffering. There is a cause of suffering, there is an end of suffering, and the path leading to the end of suffering. In all of these suttas, the Buddha is only teaching suffering and the end of suffering. And very many different stories and wraparounds to really give you a, all the different variations on that thing, depending on the audiences and the people that were listening, or whom he was addressing at the time. But the core content is just the truth. And that doesn't vary because it is that, the just that, the truth. So it's remained so. But you're not expected to uh, know it is the exact words of the Buddha and that's exactly how they were said. And I would say don't try to think of them as such. Uh, no, they're coming from an enlightened being, the Buddha, and these were his teachings. But he's telling you that you must practice this for yourself and see for yourself, and then you will know, not believe another. That's why I said earlier, it's get, uh, I, I get, uh, what's the word? I hear people talking at some length about this translation versus that translation, this Pali word meaning this or that or the other, in such detail as to, I think, well, really the whole story there is about someone who did this and it caused that. And you can put that in modern speak or in old language and, and in, in old ways of describing something. It doesn't matter. The facts of the matter is the way you need to understand it is what is important. That this was being done and it caused that to be the result. And this is what you need to know. If you want to be like when we're studying at school, English literature, you are not just getting the story of, say, a Shakespeare play, Macbeth, the story from start to finish and summing it up, you have to look into the intricacies of the way it was all described. And to be honest, I found that rather uninteresting when I was in, at school. I thought, well, I've got the story, you know, I got that, I watched the movie, I know, know what happened, <laughs> that's all I need to know. Um, all of the words used, although they're entomology and whatever is necessary often to get a meaningful understanding of say a word like a Nietzsche, a word like Dukkha or Anatta, to really appreciate them. We will tend to, once practiced and established in that practice, to use the Pali words which are no better way of describing these features of Buddhism that are important and remain unchanged throughout any culture or any period of time. So uh, we shouldn't get too mixed up in reading, writing and language and variations on translations, but really look to the truth within those teachings and try it out for ourselves. And if it works, continue with it. Um, and if it didn't, then you're perhaps misinterpreting it. So go back to it and re 
view, review what you've uh, understood from it because it's proven to work because otherwise it wouldn't still be in existence 2,568 years later being practiced and successfully produ producing enlightened beings throughout all of that time. Okay. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you have any opinions on yoga nidra and or kundalini yoga. These are two practices which I enjoy and do often. But I do not yet sit with focus on the breath. Yet I feel both of these modalities put me in a meditative state. Perhaps I'm mistaken, would you comment on this? Yes, so I, I don't know anything about yoga. I know yoga nidra is lying down. We call it in Buddhism the corpse position. So when the Buddha describes officially the meditative postures of sitting, standing, walking and lying down, sitting is like this, walking is when we walk up and down on a path, standing is standing just hands down by the side, lying down is usually portrayed as being on one's right side in a particular fashion, like you might see the Buddha rupas, the statues when he's in the lying posture. Um, and Yoga Nidra is not that, it's laying on your back. Now the reason you lie on your side thus is, I mean some monks sleep that way. I mean I do sleep that way sometimes because it's the only way you can sleep on a hard floor um, if you want to sleep on your side rather than your back. But um, Yoga Nidra is specifically a yogic practice where you lie on your back. Now if you're not well, um, or you can't sleep, or you have pain, which makes sitting, because the very best way to practice Buddhist meditation is sitting. And if you're watching the breath, you're practicing Anapanasati, it would be sitting, like I'm sitting now, half lotus position, just with your hands in your lap, like this. Um, because your spine is upright, straight, and you will remain awake like this. If you start to fall asleep, your posture will alter. You'll fall one way or the other, and this will in turn wake you up. So you'll remain awake. But it also has the ability to energize you and allows your chest to be free, to breathe easily. And this is why it's become the common position for meditation. Um, now, yoga nidra is something different. So my own experiences of it are only when I've been not very well, or I've been unable to sleep, or I've been too tired to meditate. So then I might just lie on the floor while I sleep on the floor. But the problem with regards to that is you might, you will just fall asleep unless you're really not tired. So if you cannot sleep, you can use yoga nidra, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a very good way to allow the body to settle and become relaxed, the mind to settle and become calm and to some extent you can become absorbed but you've got to be very mindful have very good uh, established mindfulness to distinguish uh, in that f posture between absorption and sleep because of course as soon as you start dreaming then you know you've gone into sleep um, and your posture may move, and this is not meditation. So it's hard to maintain wakefulness when lying comfortably on your back. To some, lying on the floor, it might not be so comfortable. But lying in a comfortable bed or on a sofa like that, then I'd suggest, I mean, that is just going to be a cause for dozing off. Um, is it... Um, is it samadhi? I, I, I think... It can be. Um, I mean, certainly if you're ill, so you're not tired, but sitting like this is difficult, uh, you might be more comfortable because you should enjoy meditation. So if that's the only posture in which you can do it, if you've tried a chair and that's no good, but you need to lie down, then yeah, it's okay. But as far as my own opinions on it, I mean, I, I'm not a yoga teacher. This doesn't come into Buddhist practice. Uh, so there, you'll hear them mentioned because often people whom are in discomfort, pain, or they're ill, 
uh, Yoga Nitra is often men mentioned. As for Kundalini, I don't know anything about it. It's a breathing technique, and you may feel that you're getting into states of absorption, and uh, or you refer to it as a meditative state, but uh, this ma very many different phenomena can be caused for very many different reasons. Now, unless it's from sitting, practicing anapanasati or mindfulness on one meditation object, I'm you know, reluctant to rather comment on the results of that practice because it isn't my, I don't have experience in that. <clears throat> oh, which is the best book to learn Abhidharma Pitaka? And then you say, it should cover all Abhidharma Pitaka concept. I'm looking for a complete book of Abhidharma Pitaka. So, what book do you think I'm going to say? The Abhidharma Pitaka. <laughs> That's the first of the three baskets. If you want a book on the Abhidharma Pitaka, read the Abhidharma Pitaka. If you want a book about the suttas, read the suttas. If you want a book about... So actually it begins with the Vinaya Pitaka, I'm sorry, the rules uh, for monks and nuns. So that's not so relevant for lay people. But a book on the suttas, the Sutta Pitaka, the basket of suttas, the Abhidharma Pitaka, the basket of the sections of the book of the Abhidharma. If you want to study Abhidharma, just study the Abhidharma. It in itself is commentaries. Um, and it in itself is complicated. I wouldn't... I can't say I wouldn't trust because I haven't read any commentaries on the Abhidharma. I've read the Abhidharma itself and I found, found, didn't find it useful to my practice, frankly. Um, and just uh, really overcomplication of a very simple subject. So some people are really into the Abhidharma, Abhidharma scholars, and they will, I'm sure, say, read the Abhidharma itself. Anything written about it is just that, written about it, it's commentary. So, you know, if you're interested in that, read it. Um, what are you, the question is answered within the question there. Okay. So, I... I perfectly understand the reason that leads to the creation of the rule not to speak about the monk attainments. But don't you think that from a deluded human being that has interest on the Dharma that needs a guarantee to spend the only thing that seems self-evident for him or her, namely his or her present experience in his or her life, sharing and proving the attainments like psychic powers could be a compassionate behavior. I'm lost here, sorry. Um, would it, that would be much help to increase the confidence. So you're wanting someone to tell you that yes, if you meditate, you will become enlightened. Absolute fact. And I can tell you that because it is my own experience. Um, that that's what you're saying by monks not being able to speak of their own attainments, whether they've attained to various stages of enlightenment, precludes that encouraging statement being made for lay people to follow and say, oh, well, the monks told me that he's reached enlightenment, so it must be true. I, I'm just going to now put all my time and effort into the practice. That's what I think you're getting to there. Um, well, you're quite right, we're not allowed to say that. Um, but to say you must practice for yourself. What we should not be concerning ourselves with too much is other people's practice, but that of our own. And like I've already said in this talk today, the Buddha asks us to go and try it for ourselves and see for ourselves. Now, if you think that's just not proof enough, not convincing enough to try, then that's up to you. Um, but if I was to tell you that it's absolutely the way it is, or even the Buddha himself was to tell you that's absolutely the way it, what it is, how are you going to believe that person telling you? Now, if they could perform magic tricks, so hovering, uh, you know, levitation above the floor, or producing some kind of magic in front of you, that might, yes, as you su suggest, might convince you to practice Sila Samadhi Panya. 
But the Buddha specifically says that whether you can levitate and produce all these magical miracle phenomena or not is irrelevant. That's not the practice. Being able to levitate, walk through walls, travel around the world in, at the speed of light is not going to free you from suffering in this lifetime, which is the object of the practice. The object of the practice is that by means of practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. If you develop psychic abilities as a result of that, it is a side effect of the practice, not the intended result. So it is not what we're aiming for. So therefore, by some other means, those same psychic abilities uh, or um, miraculous things might be achieved by some other form of practice that I, I don't know about. Um, but that other form of practice will not lead to the end of suffering in this lifetime. However, to be free from suffering in this lifetime is the only goal the Buddha is setting out within this Noble Eightfold Path. And you will know very quickly from keeping the precepts, the benefits of keeping the precepts. That is the encouragement to continue keeping the precepts. You will know very quickly from meditation, the benefits of meditation. And that is the encouragement to continue meditating. And you will know very quickly from reducing unwholesome mind states and increasing wholesome mind states, the benefits of that. And it is just that that you need for the encouragement to continue using this lifetime and this experience to practice the Noble Eightfold Path towards enlightenment, Nibbana. Could I comment on guarding the senses? So I have spoken on that, but we uh, have the senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and our thoughts is the sixth sense. Guarding of the sixth sense is perhaps the hardest, the fourth. Uh, and so the, the sixth sense is the hardest because uh, thoughts will arise, but they're usually as the result of either seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. So it's very simple. Don't look at what will stimulate the mind in the wrong way. So if you have a uh, tendency towards greed and uh, overeating, don't look at pictures of food or read menus. Uh, don't go smelling outside cake shops, bakeries, or pizza houses or something like this. Um, don't go, if you have a tendency towards enjoying music and then overindulging in entertainment, don't over listen, just listen to silence, listen to nature, listen to the natural sounds outside, the birds uh, chirping away or the chipmunks or whatever they might be on the occasion, or even the traffic, the sound of the traffic outside. Listen to just these sounds of sound. This is just being selective over which you, where you direct your attention. So it's nothing complicated. I referred to it in the, in the sense of hiri and dotapa, conscious, uh, conscience and conscientiousness, or our guards that guard the senses. Um, the, the knowledge that if we were to watch a movie containing all sorts of things, it might stimulate our thought process and minds in that direction. It would create those mind states. So rather than reducing unwholesome mind states and increasing wholesome mind states, the reverse might be true if you watch a certain type of movie. Whereas if you were to listen to a Dharma talk, then it most likely will allow your mind to settle and would increase wholesome mind states and reduce the unwholesome mind states. So that's all I meant by guarding, being selective on where you direct your attention. How many hours do we need to practice before we see any results? I meditate twice a day, 30 minutes each session. Well, we're all different. Uh, how long does it take someone to learn to swim? How long does it take someone to learn to ride a bike? Or how long does it take you to play the piano, learn to play the piano? 
or learn a foreign language. Some people pick these things up just like that, some people it takes a lifetime and they never get there. We're all different, I can't say. But what you're doing now is practicing 30 minutes twice a day, which is very good, but just gradually try and increase it. Um, not too much, because you don't want to over... You don't, to, you don't want to spoil what you've already got going. If you've got a good routine of 30 minutes, say it's in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening, then don't uh, spoil that, but you could increase it by five minutes at one end of the day uh, at first and see how that goes. We've always got time to increase it by just sleeping a little bit less, by eating a little bit less. That allows and frees up all sorts of time without interfering with our work life, our family life or our social life. Just do what you don't need to do so much of, which is usually the easiest place to find that time is sleep. So there's no specific answer to that. Um, and we are all different. There will come a time when you, uh, the Buddha was a Buddha, was fully enlightened, and he didn't need to meditate anymore. He was fully enlightened, but he very much enjoyed meditation, so would meditate, as most arahants or highly attained meditators will continue meditation because it is enjoyable. You have freedom from all of the sensory uh, discomforts of life. Um, <coughs> in essence, for a short while, you have freedom from suffering. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the wet air. With, um, within this very experience of life itself. So who wouldn't want to be doing that as much as possible? I think someone later asked me, how long do I personally meditate for each day? Well, six to nine hours each day. Someone else correctly answered underneath them. Uh, but it isn't perhaps because I need to or have to meditate six to nine hours every day. I mean, given the opportunity, I enjoy to meditate for that most of the day. Um, and that is my practice. But before, when I had many other duties in a busy, busy monastery or different living environments, or even before I ordained, I didn't have anywhere near as much as that, as, as much time as that, not every day anyway, to meditate. So it was only on special occasions or the apposita, holy days, that I would have the time that I could set aside to practice for good three hour sessions. And at first, I didn't, didn't enjoy that much. It was effort I was putting in, in order to train myself to develop these absorptions, these absorbed levels of samadhi. Um, we're looking to practice in order to attain jhanas and experience a glimpse of what our goal, our intended goal, uh, is to be free from suffering in this lifetime. So we're all different and we'll all uh, practice slightly... Oh no, we've got some killing going on in the background there. I apologize for the screamish, screamish there, but this is nature. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's uh, answer two questions there. I think maybe one more if there's a short one. Oh, that's the next question. How many hours do you meditate a day? So I actually meditate about six to nine hours every day. Most days, anyway. I mean, I, I, I'm very fortunate that I have that amount of time free because I've ordained, I'm a monk, and that's why I'm here living in this situation in Sri Lanka, um, where I am afforded that opportunity to do that. I don't live in a community, in a monastery, whereby there'd all be sorts of other responsibilities to maintain that place. This is very simply and easily maintained. I just have my three robes, my one bowl, nothing much to take care of as you can see here, and that is my needs for the day met. My food, my clothing, my shelter, and any basic medicines that are necessary um, are usually available. I don't need much fortunately, I'm quite well. So th the time I have here I can use for meditation because I enjoy that time meditating. So on that note, I should uh, uh, leave it there uh, and uh, hope there's something of use. If there is, please use it. If not, then uh, let it go. 
Uh, if you find this interesting and think someone else might be interested, then please share and do subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, be happy and stay well. Suki Hotu.